Hello, boys and girls. In the last episode, you saw us build the hindquarters of the wall structures. So in this episode, we'll head forwards. Let's get right into it. With most of the rear structure in place, the next thing I think I want to tackle is the door aperture. We have been using our crayons here, so we've been drawing figures and using colors to figure out exactly what it is that we want. We've examined the dimensions of the door and the uh, different shapes that the frame has got and all of those things and we have come to the conclusion that if we were to attach the door frame to the bottom 40 by 40, the threshold would be very tall. So with hindsight, I shouldn't have welded the bottom part in, but hindsight's always 2020, as you know. So I am simply going to brace it, cut it off, and then weld the frame straight to the 4040. That way we get the door a little bit lower and also the entrance and the steps will be working more like they were planned to be. Planned? Oh well. I will put a 20 by 40 as planned here with the 40 to the side and the 20 towards the front and back. That way we have a strong straight upright here. It will be a little bit too strong with the door frame there too, but in this case I don't mind. I could complicate it and maybe get the door 20 millimeters forward. I just feel that that would be complicating things for the sake of complicating things. We have also checked this dimension here and according to this the door doesn't actually need to be any further forward so everything is okay with that and this straight line here is obviously without any insulation so it would come even further back for that. I also want to say that these fireball tool magnetic uh, shims spacers are very handy with things like this because it easily means that I can visualize where 30 millimeters extra is going to be or how thick the insulation is going to be and things like that. So highly recommended. Just a few minutes ago I was recording a piece where I was saying that uh, I was going to use the planned <laughs> plans schmans uh, 40 by 20 piece here and just as I was saying what I was saying my head started reprocessing everything and uh, I've had to re-record this now because the plans changed. The plan is to have 60 millimeters of insulation on this wall uh, that gives uh, 10 millimeters extra space between the insulation and the actual door frame but the door frame is stepped so it has got another 30 millimeters in so this is where the actual hole for the door is the actual aperture where we can walk in to the camper and that's a little bit too far out I thought it was going to be okay but 20 millimeters is better so having stood here thinking and talking at the same time, it turns out that I am going to complicate this unlike what I said in the clip that you won't see. I am going to put a 20 by 20 bar next to the frame. I'm going to butt weld it to the frame there and it's going to ex basically go all the way up to the top of the door frame. Then I'm going to put the originally intended 40 by 20 on the front edge of that one. That way we have a 60 millimeter wide door frame here which is the same as the insulation and then further up where it is not needed we just have the 40. And then I also thought about various other complications but in my head I'm basically going to take the door frame out here I'm going to doctor it in on the welding table and then when it comes to fit here it is going to cover all of this area here bar the 
parts that are going to be between the, this upright and that one. But I'm going to do the top of the door frame up there and the front thing there and that's it. I, I hope the visual aids that I'm going to record later is going to explain what's going on inside my head. <laughs> Plans, schmans, wans. I really don't want to start with a wonky door frame. So I made extra sure that at least the hinge side would be straight-ish. I'm first checking the frame with my one meter ruler and I noticed that there's a slight bend. I then used the 40 by 40 by 3 box section to help make it straight. Then I could unclamp the big box section and replace it with the 20 by 20 box section that I was to weld to the 20 by 40 frame. Let's hope this little extra effort will keep the door opening and closing smoothly for a long time. With the integral corner post now welded into place, I'm going to brace the bottom here and then cut it, cut this, this piece off so that it sits 40 millimeters lower. As you might have noticed from the time lapse yesterday, we finished off the work with uh, having that 20 mil bar stitch welded and ground onto there, and then 
the extension stick there that goes up to the roof there and then I triangulated there because it just felt right. At the bottom I have the uh, spacer that is the correct distance. I need to move it to the center when I weld it in place or, or do the reinforcements and then I have the brace at the bottom there. I did a test fit yesterday and the test fit revealed that either that bottom bar there isn't completely level with the truck or the upright because when I put the door frame in place it was tilting forward a bit. I measured the angle on this one and compared it to this one and it's out by like 0.4 degrees or something like that. Up at the top that means that the uh, the top of the 20 by 40 is sticking out at the front a bit. I'm going to clean up the metal there and then I'm going to try I'll fit it again to see if that made any difference. I don't think it will but uh, the thing I probably need to do is I need to cut, uh, shorten that leg just a tiny bit. It's almost so little that I might even do it with uh, a hand file but then again I'm lazy so probably not. Let's do it. Crazy one just brought me my Al Pacino here. But uh, it was good timing because I just finished finagling that bottom end there and only that bottom end there. The front part there has been left untouched and uh, you can see the value there 0.0, .0. and that is with it not even clamped up there. It's just stuck in. Uh, the only clamp is actually down there. And uh, yeah, the length of that was millimeter perfect. I guess uh, I need to verify it once I have ground off the, the welds. Because uh, yeah, it's easier to grind off the welds uh, on a flat table rather than climbing there. I'm going to enjoy my Al Pacino and then I'm gonna grind the welds off and then I think it's time to clamp this down and uh, fit it permanently. Mm, mm, mm. There is a tasty Al Pacino. Excuse my sniffling, seems like there has been a pollen bomb dropped around here at the moment. Anyway, uh, I thought I pressed record on the time lapse, apparently I didn't, so you couldn't see me uh, doing the clamp champ system here. Uh, the reason why there's so many clamps here is because of this bit here. And those of you who have followed this one before might know, or maybe I didn't tell you, that this surface here 
which is part of the side uh, should be within one millimeter of the other side so that one should be correct but as I welded this one in after I welded this one in the whole tub after I welded this one in there's a discrepancy there so again the order is this sticky out bit the tub and the side and the side is correct so I have decided over the period of the progress of the truck build that I will not increase the discrepancy. I will not yield to this being the wrong length. I have clamped that big 40 by 40 up there on the, on the upright and on the roof. I have clamped the fireball tool square up there and then I have made this long bar here that is clamped on one, two, three, four, five, five places before it comes to the door aperture. And then in addition to that, I also clamp this diagonal piece here. The front is clamped there with a plate and some G clamps. And that has yielded in this discrepancy here. It is smaller than I thought, and if I move it like this, you can see that it, it is actually loose there and it is not uh, binding. The discrepancy is 2.5 millimeters. The largest discrepancy is thus up here. So it tapers off to here, and then I believe it is pretty much spot on here. With that in mind, I'm going to have to correct this at some point. With that decision made, I think... Uh, it's time for the trusty old Spattermaster 5000 to uh, make this a permanent mistake up uh, uh, door aperture. I welded in this reinforcement bar here. It felt like a natural continuation of the 40 by 40 here. And then I welded in that 45 degree there. The, the bar that comes from the top corner there isn't really 45 degrees. So it might look a little bit odd. So luckily we're putting cladding on this. But again, the idea being that, that the forces from this outrigger here eventually end up in the top corner there. And on a side note, I haven't been able to weld that because Spattermaster 5000 is down here. So I need my power woman to help me lift it up there somehow. At the moment, there's a few sticks in the way, so we might have to lift it from the other side. But uh, that problem, that moment. The actual reason why I'm talking to you at the moment is that uh, we now have two parallel bars here. And in my head, parallel bars are uh, bad juju. Luckily, the fix is very simple. Add more steel. And in this case, I'm going to add a couple more of the triangulations in there, uh, just uh, 45 degrees. And that should uh, not only hold them uh, side, uh, back to front, uh, but also up and down. I could probably get away with just putting horizontal ones there. Much easier to create and put in there, but you know, I don't think that complication is the thing that's going to ruin this uh, project if something is. so. Without further mumbling, I am going to uh, please my inner triangulation nerd and put two bars in.
Looks like we have a door frame. I've probably gone a little bit overboard with the reinforcements, but uh, that's not adding very much weight and it adds a tremendous amount of strength, especially when you do it like this in a zigzag pattern. I also did the uh, cross there, up there, sorry, there. So now the, the front here is uh, triangulated and that obviously should be very, very strong. So I think uh, I'm done for tonight. Kaz is continuing with the painting and primering, so I'm going to leave her alone so she gets some stuff done. It's been a productive day, but uh, yeah, still a bit more to do before we can hang some curtains. A new day here, and as you know, we fixed uh, the door frame in place. So the next thing I think I'm going to do is fill that uh, gap there. Uh, I can't do this bit and the sides, as you know, for the windows, can't do those yet. So let's uh, grab the low hanging fruit and put some zigzag sticks in there. After a lot of trial fitting, finessing and removing rust, I now have the three sticks there on the table. On the truck I've marked out uh, where they should go and also where I need to remove the rust converter. So before welding, that's what I need to do.
the welding was going pretty okay and then the wind turned and uh, the wind also picked up so yeah no more welding for now maybe i can do some grinding or something we'll see Whilst you're watching me have a fantabulous time with the grinders, I thought I'd share the loose philosophy behind the box construction. As you have probably twigged already, there's not many parallel pieces in this design. This is obviously fully intentional. If you have not seen episode 24, titled Why We Haven't Started Our Box Build, then I'll quickly fill you in. Most camper boxes are made using SIPs, that is, structural insulated panels. That's typically two hard materials such as a plastic, metal or plywood panel with an insulating foam core. These boxes are suitable for most camper builds. However, they don't offer super strength. They can be reinforced with steel structures inside the panels, but when we inquired about these types of boxes, no manufacturer would guarantee a load on the back wall. The back wall is where we want to transport stuff, primarily two small motorbikes. This is why we are building a steel skeleton to take the forces from the extra weight. To minimize the needed amount of steel, we want to use the steel as efficiently as possible. Steel as a material is very good in tension. That's when forces are pulling on it. It's pretty good in compression too. In other words, when a weight is pushing on it. Steel is less efficient with bending forces. In other words, we want to use the steel we install in a way where the forces are either pushing or pulling on the material. We also want to distribute all the forces to other points so that they all share the effort and thus we can use less material. Luckily, all of these things have been solved a long time ago. It's very simple. Triangulations. A triangle is a very strong shape as it distributes the forces and it prevents racking, which is a bad motion. We can admire this design in things like the Eiffel Tower, airplane frames, the Maserati Tipo 61, also known as the Birdcage, the Mercedes 300 SL, and last, and definitely one of the least weighing pieces of art, the Porsche 917 frame weighing in at an astonishing 42 kilos. This is why we are building this structure the way we are. Every force, sideways, up, down, front, back, should be distributed and shared through triangular shapes. We hope that, through this design, we can create a very strong but still relatively lightweight structure that's capable of carrying a load on the back, have a strong enough roof to use as a terrace, and house all our stuff on the inside. The downside of this design is that it requires a lot of custom fabrication, a lot of welding, but also a silly amount of grinding and finishing. At a guess, I think that the grinding takes four times longer than the welding. Anyway, this is how we think we'll achieve the best result, and this way is probably not suitable for many other builds, so we fully understand if this is not for you. Whilst you're watching me removing metal and making sparks, I wanted to share with you our thoughts and methodology on how we are finishing and protecting the metal skeleton. First of all, I'm grinding all the welds flat, and I'm doing this on both the inside and outside of the skeleton, as these surfaces need to be flat for us to be able to mount the cladding and insulation. You're possibly wondering why I'm also grinding all the corners, as these aren't even going to be visible. Well, there's a couple of reasons for this. The main one's for my mental health. Even if I can't see the unground welds once the box is assembled, I'll know that they're there. Other than pleasing my ego, all the grinding is giving me the opportunity to check that all the welds look okay. I can see whether or not there is a good amount of metal there, and what the welds look like. Once I'm done with the grinding, the skeleton needs to be protected from the elements. Before we started fabricating the box, I did some trials and some box section offcuts. We tried a couple of different rust converters, primers and top coats, and all the different permutations of them. I then left them outside under a tree to see how they held up. We initially tried some paints from the local hardware store. These simply weren't suitable for varying reasons. The paint was too thick, the finish wasn't tough enough, I could go on. I then came across a range of products by Rostio that seemed to get good reviews. The rust converter can be brushed on and doesn't need to be rinsed off, and the samples that were left outside without any primer or top coat on have held up reasonably well. We also tried a Rostio primer. This gave good results, and we probably would have stuck with this if we had managed to get a top coat on in a suitable length of time. After a lot of deliberation over what top coat to use, we decided to use a paint system designed for yachts. The materials that we are using are similar, and the box needs to be able to withstand the sun, water and salt in the winter. 
After the Rostio Rust converter has been applied, we are using a two-part epoxy primer and undercoat called Interprotect from International Paints, and we will eventually paint on a top coat also from International. Not sponsored! Due to the length of time it has taken to finish this, the durability of the epoxy primer is being put to the test, and I'm pleased to say that it's doing a very good job and has held up really well. We've just been getting on with uh, stuff today, so haven't been filming anything. Uh, we have fully welded the cross bit up there and ground it and the same thing with the bottom bit here we've attached the vertical bar to the upright and uh, yeah it's all gone quite well and and to finish the day off I'm going to uh, use the wire and uh, not the wire wheel the nylon brush just to rough up the surface then I'm going to rust convert and then we've got a nice two-pack epoxy primer for those who are interested in what we're using so that's what's happened today. Nothing exciting. So back to work. Okay, boys and girls, I know this doesn't make the best YouTube videos, just having intermittent uh, hello everybody stuff. Uh, but uh, another day here, uh, it's been a while as usual, life comes in between, but uh, we seem to have a day where the weather isn't too bad and uh, everything else seems to be sorted for a while. So we can get on with this. Uh, last time I used the welder to do those things up there and same on the other side. The back ones here still need doing. More importantly, these ones are still open uh, in between those ones, which means that water can gather in there. So I need to check if there's water in there before I weld that. We have a cap for the big ones and uh, my immediate next step is to remove this temporary support bracket that has already cracked in a few places. Um, so I need to undo those welds there and then I need to clean up around here and there and do that. And then proceed with the rest as much as I can. So nothing exciting today again. I will probably just simply not film anything because this is... Uh, Nothing more than fighting with uh, an angle grinder, an uh, angle grinder wire brush, the welder, the weather. Uh, so you'll probably just see me under a sheet welding if, and uh, you know, as far as YouTube content goes, that's not very good. So without further waffling, uh, let me get on with that and we'll see what uh, emerges as footage. It feels a little bit like Groundhog Day, but uh, let's see what progress we made yesterday. Anywho. Uh, these parts here up to above that one are now uh, fully welded, ground and primered. There's a few places where my inner perfectionist is screaming in agony so I might have to come back and uh, quieten that one down but overall it's good. One thing that I probably didn't show you uh, and that you don't know is that I have uh, folded this one up now to the correct angle and welded the sides. So that is sort of where the plan is to put the cladding for the wall one too. The top parts up there are still to be ground and cleaned up and primered and all that stuff. But before we do that, there are parts on this side that still haven't been fully welded, kind of what I did yesterday there. So the next thing I'm going to do is to fully weld these and hopefully if we if we are lucky or, or skillful or energetic enough, we will have this bottom part also primed by the end of today. The work yesterday took a lot of energy out of me, so I'm a little bit fatigued today, but uh, hopefully we'll get some useful progress out of this. And um, I'm sorry that this is not uh, your typical YouTube bish bosh bash, karate chops and finger snap. What I want to convey with this is that these things take time and we want to build this truck the way we want and uh, there's no shortcuts. Uh, the only way this is going to get done is if I or Kaz do it. So yeah, we just need to keep doing stuff. And on that note, bye! Good morning. I've got the power tools out again today and I'm wire wheeling up some welds, that, some tack welds that Yoko did earlier so you can fully weld them. Then I'm going to get the angle grinder out, grind them down and get them ready for rust converting and priming. We've already made a start here. So that's today's um, victim, sorry, specimen. <laughs> I'm <laughs> going
Kaz has done a great job in uh, grinding the bottom part of this section here. Uh, I welded some of them earlier, so I believe that means that everything is now fully welded, all the sticks that are in place. This part obviously still needs uh, primering. We still need to do those bottom things there, and uh, tops still need grinding and primering. But uh, a little progress is still good progress. So big thanks to Cass for persevering today with the angle grinder. And today on Welding in the Wind, we are going to weld the cap onto that one and the cap onto that one. We have already checked that uh, the box sections here and here do not contain any water, just denitrol uh, anti-corrosion stuff as they should do. So without further waffling, let's get to work. I have bashed this piece, this lip, into place. It is now guided by this 40x40. 40 40. So I'm now going to weld the corners there, and the corners there, and a little hole down there that you might or might not see. Uh, anyway, the idea with this one is that uh, we will have the flat uh, surface here to bond the GRP skin to, just like I have made here. So. Let's do the welding. Hey Kaz, what you doing? Rust converting and painting. Yay! Get in there. Stick by stick, one stick at a time. I've spent today doing the final bits of grinding, rust converting and painting on the walls of the box, which means that we now have a box and we now have a new episode. So, thanks for watching and please bear with us whilst we crawl through the footage for the next one. <laughs>